Okay, so we're, we finally leapfrogged the class that we did like two days ago um, with, or, or three days ago, really, with uh, where we went backtrack to get the compare and contrast uh, after we had done the analyze plot element. So now we're back on track, unit one, uh, lesson 17, which is analyze uh, character. So this will be fun today, all right? So we'll crack open our student book, lesson 17. All right, and by the time we complete the lesson today, we will be able to describe physical traits of characters in a story, describe thoughts and actions of characters in a story, and analyze character to help understand theme and main idea. Right. So our little audio here. Characters are the fictional people that authors create in their story. <laughs> authors bring characters to life by describing their appearance, thoughts, words, gestures, action, and other characters' responses to them. Understanding characters and why they do what they do can help you understand an author's main ideas and themes. Yeah, and we all have our favorite characters, right? Whether it's in a film or television or a book. And those are the, the things, the traits uh, that, you know, there's something that we identify with, whatever it may be. You know, it might be appearance or the way they think and the, the way they talk or, you know, their gestures. Um, so it's something very relatable to us. You know, we could we could think about uh, characters that we we enjoy watching or reading about, and and think about the traits that they display and why we may. And same thing with villains, right? There's there's reasons we may hate a particular villain more than others because of you know maybe the the way they talk or act or you know the way they look. Um, so that's all about <laughs> analyzing character. Okay. So our first little text here uh, says Gold Rush Entrepreneur. And this is from, we'll go ahead and take a look, from My Antonia by Willa, Willa Cather, 1918. And she writes, if all the girls and boys who grew up together in Black Hawk, Tiny Soderball was to <laughs> lead the most adventurous life and to achieve the most solid worldly success. While she was running her lodging house in Seattle, gold was discovered in Alaska. Miners and sailors came back from the north with wonderful stories and pouches of gold. That daring, which nobody had ever suspected in her, awoke. She sold her business and set out for Circle City. That winter, Tiny kept in her hotel a Swede who deeded Tiny Soderball his claim on Hunker Creek. Tiny went off into the wilds and lived on the claim. She bought other claims from dis, uh, discouraged miners, traded or sold them on percentages. After nearly um, 10 years in the Klondike, Tiny returned with a considerable fortune to live in San Francisco. I met her in Salt Lake City in 1908. She told me about some of the desperate chances she had taken in the gold country, but the thrill of them was quite gone. She said, frankly, that nothing interests her much now but making money. I was in San Francisco two summers ago when both Lena and Tiny Soderball were in town. Tiny audits Lena's accounts occasionally and invests her money for her. And Lena apparently takes care that Tiny doesn't grow too miserly. And up above, <laughs> pointing to the first bracket there, it says, because the narrator was known uh, because the narrator has known Tiny since childhood, his perceptions of her can provide insight as to how she may have changed over the years. So we see a sense of adventure early on and then more, you know, interested in money after that. <laughs> and uh, B, so Lena's concern that Tiny might grow too miserly indicates that Tiny's interest in making money is not related to a desire to spend money. 
So miserly, right, is an, uh, if somebody is miserly or a miser, they're, you know, don't care for people that much. They tend to be kind of cranky uh, and they also tend to, you know, collect wealth. So, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge, right? If you're familiar with the Dickens story, Scrooge is the perfect idea of a miser. Um, that's the idea there, right? And, and that's what they're worried about her becoming as she's collecting more wealth. Okay, so over to our quiz. Analyze character. All right, open up the quiz here. And same thing, same passage, right? Gold Rush Businesswoman. Our text note here using logic says the way that one character perceives another character can provide information about either character or both characters. In the passage, the narrator's words tell you about time. So, right, in, in this case, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, he's, he's showing some sure. concern as she gets older. Uh, but in, in, in other situations, it may tell you a lot about the you know the the you know the the perspective of the author or or you know how they interact with another character you know particularly you know if it's like a child who's you know playing and 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 you know laughing and and is really happy and another character is like you know scratching their nose and you know acting like they don't you know care for the child then you know that might say that that you know indicates that that person doesn't like children you know something like that. All right, so uh, our first question, number one on the quiz. Etta, would you like to read number one for us? Okay, it says, what does the narrator's description of Tiny reveal about her? A, the hope of becoming rich was her only motivation for going to Alaska. B, she has been a bold and resourceful explorer since she was a child. C, she is obsessed with making money because she gave up her business for the chance to find gold. Or D, her sense of adventure has given way to a need for security. And is it B? It's uh, D. B's pretty close, right? Because she, she did have a bold, resourceful, well, not so much as a child, but as she gets older. So there was a sense there, but when she's an adult, is when she actually, you know, sells off her business to go look for gold and gets these claims on land. Um, but, you know, D, we, we, we get both ends of it. So we see this transition in her character from someone who had a sense of adventure giving way, to, you know, to a need for security. So that's part of that miserly idea, right? Kind of hoarding your, your wealth and, and shutting people out. That's giving them a sense of security. D is a dog for number one, okay. And we'll take some turns reading through, oh, this is uh, Edgar Allan Poe. So a really famous uh, piece here. Um, Tracy, would you like to read the first paragraph for us? Yes. Careful reparations. It is impossible to say how first the, the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. A threat there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. He has never wronged me. He had never given me in short. For his God, I had no desire. I think, I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eyes of a virtual, a pale blue eye with a frame over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold and so by degrees, very gradually, I make up my mind 
to take the life of the old man and thrust with myself of the eye forever. All right. So, <clears throat> yeah, this this man is basically talking about his is wanting to get rid of this old man and explaining that it, it's not because you know I, I loved him and he never wronged me and he never gave me insult and I there's nothing that I desire from him uh and you know this this is somebody that's falling into you know insanity right this is somebody that that's that's troubled and you know the old man has this weird eye and that's what's causing him grief right this is he can't he can't stand for the man to look at him with that eye anymore um so and you know consider the title here careful preparations as we look at the second paragraph uh grace could you read the second paragraph for us okay now this is the point you fancy me mad mad men know nothing but you should but you should have seen me you should have seen how wisely i proceeded with what caution with what foresight with what dissimulation i went to work I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I first put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I trust in my head, oh, you would have loved to see how cunningly i trust it in i moved it slowly very very slowly so that i might not i might not disturb the old man's sleep it took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening within the opening so far that i could see the old man as he lay upon his bed ha would a madman have been so wise as this and then, when my head was well within the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously for the hands crick. I undid it just to, I, undi, I, I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. And every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who versed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into his chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So, so you see, he will have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at 12, I looked in upon him while he slept. From the tell, from the tell tale heart by Edgar Allan Poe in 1843. Yeah, thanks. So it's, yeah, like you see this guy, right? He's, he's losing his mind. He's checking in on this old man. He's taking him like an hour every night. He's creeping in and he's wanting to see if the eyes open. Um, and then in the morning, right, he's he's concealing the fact that he's been spying on the old man and watching him at night by, you know, courageously, you know, he spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, right? So coming into his room and like, hey, how was your night and everything, trying to mask the fact that he's, you know, going to, you know, do something horrible to the old man. Um, you will go ahead and uh, Grace read the question for us too. Okay. On the basis of the details in the passage, what relationship does the narrator most likely have with the old man? A, the old man is the narrator's father. B, the narrator take, takes care of the old man. C, the narrator is the old man's employer. And D, the narrator is the old man. A, <laughs> the narrator and the old man are longtime enemies. Mm, is this C? Or B. 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 You get the impression, right? B is a boy that the, the uh, old man or, or, or the narrator takes care of the old man, right? There, there's some, we can't, don't really have enough to say that's his father, 
there does seem to be some type of, uh, you know, connection there, but, um, and we don't really hear anything about employment, right? And he actually alludes to that. He's like, I don't have any need for his gold. Uh, and, you know, he says that he loves the old man. So they're not enemies. So B as a boy, right? He must be taking care of the old man. Okay. And question three. Um, Christiana, could you read question three for us? Number three. Mm -hmm. Okay, which hey, what is the narrator's motive motivation for planning to kill the old man? A he results sorry, he resents the old man's world. B he seeks revenge for the old man's cru cru cruelty. Cru Cruelty towards him. See, he is fright. He is frightened by the old man's pale blue eye. D. He wants to end the old man's suffering. Is C. Yep. Yeah. Lots of focus on the pale blue eye. Right. He's going into his room at night and he's trying to shine one single beam of light onto the eye to see if it's open. Um, yes. Three C. Season cat. All right. Uh, Capri, you can read number four for us. The narrator uses words such as wisely and cunningly to convince readers that he is sane, educated, blameless, or organized. I want to say organized. It's uh, sane. Sane. Yeah wisely and cunningly so uh right he's he's trying to explain to the reader explain to the you know uh the observers there that you know his actions the way he's methodically moving and, and doing all these things that he's acting uh you know this isn't the you know uh the 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 behavior of somebody who's gone absolutely fruit loops right um but in fact it is <laughs> so but that's the thing about crazy people right crazy people don't know they're crazy if you yeah. say you're you know if you're if you're saying well i'm crazy it's like no you're not crazy if you think you're crazy you're not crazy crazy people don't know they're crazy uh so a for number four this all seems reasonable to him the way he's acting right this seems like the a, a normal sane reasonable behavior so uh four is a and um, five, Etta, you want to read number five for us? Okay. The narrator says that moving his head through the doorway to look into the old man's into the old man's bedroom took an hour. What does this statement reveal about the narrator? A. He is sensibly cautious and methodical. Meth methodical. Yep. He he respects the old man's need for rest. His description of his own actions are exaggerated. His actions are not reasonable. Is it A? It's uh, D, right? Yeah. Now, he, of course, thinks what he's doing is cautious and methodical, uh, mm -hmm. right? It, it, seems, it seems reasonable to him. But um, this is where you have to step out of the the character you know the 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 thoughts of the character and think about you know is this reasonable um prob probably not <laughs> this this makes me think i you know I, I, I know you all have kids um i don't know uh you know the ages when my daughter was little she would just come and stand by her bed sometimes <laughs> It's, you know, all of a sudden you, you wake up and there's this little figure like, you know, right oh, at your, your eye line <laughs> and you're just like, oh, and, you know, so it, it just kind of made me think of that, you know, like him watching this old man at night. And she yeah, was I wake so, up to my daughter in my bed every night, so. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I, ours was always really good. You know, she, she was a great sleeper. She would go, you know, she would even, you know, be like, I'm going to bed and, you know, go you know, climbing her bed. So it was that much worse because we, 
didn't really expect to see her, you know, that much at night or something. And then every once in a while, yeah, she would, you know, get up, she'd have a bad dream or something or not feel well. And, you know, you're just like looking into these, this little head, you're like, Oh God. <laughs> so right. think, think of that. All right. Um, so number six, um, let's see here. Uh, Tracy, would you like to finish off the quiz for us? Number six. Yes. Which was best if the price the narrator a dependable and helpful b innocent and trusting c fearless and arrogant d irrational and obsessed um d irrational and obsessed you're right. So that's that's definitely someone acting irrational and obsessed, right? He's obsessed with the the, the weird eye of the old man. Uh, there's an obsession there, and and his activities surrounding that are uh, you know really uh, you know off the wall, falls out of the realm of normal behavior, right? So D is in dog for number six, and let's run through them real quick. So one, D as in dog, two, B as in boy, three, C for cat, four, A, five, D as in dog, and six, D as in dog. All right, everybody got that? All right, well, let's see here. We will move over to the workbook. We're gonna think we're gonna visit Edgar Allan Poe here in this next section as well. And following up, it says characters are the fictional people that make stories interesting and often memorable. Readers who analyze characters' behaviors can better understand the plot and action stories. So it goes hand in hand, right? If you know the characters better, if you know their intentions, if you know their thoughts, you know how they're going to react to a situation that's going to help you reinforce those ideas behind plot uh, and, and help you summarize something too. You know, uh, we we're talking, you know, about, about summarizing uh, the other day, you know, main points of a character would be good for summarizing. You don't want to get into lengthy things, but if you're, you know, talking about the character in Telltale Hearts, you, you know, you would, in, in Telltale Heart, you would want to say, you know, he's, you know, a man losing his mind, right? That's a characteristic that's really important to the story. Uh, analyzing characters involves not only noticing what they say and do, but how they look and behave and what others say or think about them. Even a small detail about a character's appearance or a gesture can provide clues about what he or she is thinking and feeling. And this is actually leads right into that here with the Reverend Mr. Hooper. Um, so it says the cause of so much amazement may appear sufficiently slight. Mr. Hooper, a gentlemanly person of about 30, though still a bachelor, was dressed with due clerical neatness, as if a careful wife had starched his band and brushed the weekly dust from his Sunday's garb. There was but one thing remarkable in his appearance, swathed about his forehead and hanging down over his face, so low as to be shaken by his breath. Mr. Hooper had on a black veil. On a nearer view, it seemed to consist of two folds of crepe, which entirely concealed his features except the mouth and chin, but probably did not in, uh, intercept his sight further than to give a darkened aspect to all living and inanimate things. With this gloomy shade before him, good Mr. Hooper walked onward at a slow and quiet pace, stooping somewhat and looking on the ground, as is customary with abstracted men, yet nodding kindly to those of his parishioners who still waited on the meeting house steps. But so wonderstruck were they that this greeting hardly met with a return. Uh, and the, you know, this is from the minister's black veil, right? You always take uh, account of the title. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1836. And something else, right? We want to consider sometimes when we look at these older pieces, uh, these older passages, 1836, 
uh, to not be married at the age of 30 was a little strange, right? Um, that today isn't a big deal. So you have to kind of keep that in mind as far as what the age is. So a man at age 30, uh, you would think because of the way he's neatly dressed, right, and, and, and well-groomed that he, you know, would be married, but oddly enough, he's not. Uh, so yeah, and then over here, when it, uh, our, our brackets between the, the underlying part and the beginning and the end, uh, it's saying, you know, phrases such as dress with due clerical neatness and stooping as is customary with abstracted men indicate that he is tidy, methodical, and intellectual. The next box says, um, the way that one character responds to another provides insight into both characters. The parishioners hardly return Mr. Hooper's greeting because they are taken aback by his appearance. And the thing that's making his appearance odd is the black veil, right? This, this, this piece over his face. So that's obviously, you know, no matter whether it's today or 1836 was something that was very unusual. So that's how they're reacting to it. It's sort of like, you know, looking at him sideways, kind of like, oh, hey, what's up, Mr. Hooper? Um, yeah, that's the idea there. All right, making assumptions. People make assumptions about someone who walks into a room. The person's hair, clothes, poise, and style sense give a first impression. Characters can make similar impressions. So, you know, that's just part of human nature. We see somebody come into a room. Uh, <laughs> there was a great SNL sketch. <laughs> Uh, a few years ago, it was, it was Chance the Rapper, and he's playing a judge, and it's like uh, a people's court situation. And, you know, the defendant would come in, you know, they're like nice, you know, dressed and everything. And then like some dude would come in, he's wearing like some garish, like, you know, a, a purple suit with like a, a checkered tie or something. He would make like bang the gavel and go guilty <laughs> just based on appearance. Uh, and that's, you know, what we, we do, we kind of assign judgment to people, uh, it, you know, right or wrong, we, we will look at somebody and we, we make assumptions about them. Same thing with characters. Um, and a lot of times authors will, may do that purposefully to mislead us. They may introduce an important character. I think of, um, uh, if you guys are familiar with the Harry Potter series, uh, Lupin in, uh, in, uh, which, which one was that? Prisoner of Azkaban. And they're on the train together. And Lupin is all hunched in a corner. And he's this kind of shadowy, dark figure. And, you know, Harry, Hermione, and Ron are on the train in the, in the same car with them. And they're kind of, you know, what's going on with this dude? And it turns out he's, you know, one of the heroes uh, in the long term. But she introduces him as this kind of, you know, shadowy character sitting in a corner. So it may also be to mislead. And those are, again, you know, really, you know, great devices that, that authors will use. Okay, so our first question, um, Christiana, would you like to read number one for us? Um, okay. According to the description of the way Mr. Opa dressed and walked, he seems awkward and a awkward and strange, be neat and reserved. Um, C self-conscious and shy. D troubled and unfriendly. Um, C. So B, yeah, B as in boy. He was he was neat, reserved. Um. Now that that can be somewhat shy, right, or or self conscious. You can think of somebody as being reserved, as a little bit, you know, standoffish. You know, not necessarily wanting to interact with other people. Uh, but definitely his appearance, everything we see about his appearance is that he's he's well groomed. He, he you know he's he looks like he's married, like his wife is taking care of him. You know, as it's implied in nineteen thirty or no, I mean eighteen thirty eight or whatever this was written. So B as in boy for number one. All right. In our same passage, Grace, would you like to read question two for us? 
Okay. Which statement best confirmed that Mr. Hooper's veil has a chilling effect on his appearance? A, he looks down at the ground as he walks. B, the veil completely conceals his eyes. C, parishioners do not return his greeting. And D, the veil is the only remarkable thing about him. D? C. Yeah, C is in cat, right? Parishioners do not return his greeting. So we, we know that, you know, that he's walking out with this, wearing this veil and the parishioners are kind of like, you know, he's he's saying hello to him, and they're just sort of, you know, it, it's it's distracting. It's it's it, it, it's you know not setting well with them. C or number two, and the appeal of Nix. We'll swap out here. Everybody get a chance to read a little bit. Capri, would you like to read paragraph one on the appeal of Nick? Sure. It is difficult to convey in words the charm that Nick possessed. Seeing him, you beheld merely a medium-sized young mechanic in reasonably grimmed garage clothes then when working, and in tight pants, tight coat, silk shirt, long visored green cap when at leisure, a rather pallid skin due to the nature of his work, large drift hands, a good deal like the hands of a surgeon, square, blunt-fingered, spatulated. Indeed, as you saw him at work, a wire-netted electric bulb held in one hand, and other plunged deep in the vitals of the car on which he was engaged. You thought of a surgeon performing a major operation. All right. Yeah, and uh, so... One of those words, right? Don't encounter much. Spatulate. Um, you can, you know, use your 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 context clues there, right? We're talking about square, blunt fingered, spatulate. Spatulate basically means like broad at the end, rounded and broad at the end, uh, like a spatula, right? That's that's sort of the root of the word there. So uh, just to you know, think about especially when we're talking about descriptions of, of, of people and stuff, you come into an unfamiliar word. Um, Edo, you want to read the second paragraph for us? Okay. All this, of course, could not serve to endear him to the girls. On the contrary, you would have thought that his hands alone, from which he could never quite free the grease and grit, would have caused some feeling of repugnance among the lily-fingered but they somehow seem always to be finding an excuse to touch him. His tie, his hair, his coat sleeve, they seem even to derive a, vic what is it? Vicarious? Uh, vicarious. 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 <laughs> vicarious thrill from holding his hat or cap when on an outing, they brushed imaginary bits of lint from his coat. Level. Okay. Yeah. Um, vicarious is sort of like living through someone else's experience. So they're kind of living in his world by, by holding his cap, that kind of idea. And anyone take a guess what lily fingered in this context would mean? Dainty, <laughs> soft fingered woman. Yeah. Yeah. Soft fingered. That's, that's excellent. Delicate. Right. Uh, so, you know, he's, he, you know, this guy's it's an interesting character setting up, right? It's somebody who's, who's, who's a grease monkey. He's, you know, he works in a garage, uh, but the way he goes about it, you know, shows that he's very technically minded. Um, and then we're going to, you know, in a minute here, you'll see how this, this wraps up. Uh, I'll read the little one here. It says, no, it can't be classified. This powerful draw he had for them. His conversation furnished no clue. It was commonplace conversation, limited, even dull. Uh, Tracy, would you like to read the last paragraph? Uh, his unconcern should have infuriated, infuriated them, but it served to be, he wasn't actually, actually as unconcerned as he appeared. 
but he had only learned that effort in their direction was unnecessary. Nick had little imagination, a gorgeous selfishness, a tolerance, a tolerantly contemptuous, likely for the sex naturally. However, his attitude toward them had been somewhat ambitious by being obliged to watch their method of driving a car in and out of the ideal garage doorway. His own manipulation of the of the will were nothing shot up with a right. Okay, and so what we're looking at, right? We see a physical description of him in the first paragraph, um, <clears throat> and you know, sort of how he goes about his job. We see how others react to him, right? He's, you know, women women are attracted to him. That's very obvious. Um, and, and then finally, sort of, you know, more of, a, of an internal description of him and, and maybe how he kind of uh, thinks about himself and, 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 you know, more of his behavior, you know, more of his personality. Not, you know, not a exciting person, really. What, you know, anyone says this conversation is furnished, no clue. It was commonplace conversation, limited, even dull. Uh, not that he's dull, but, you know, his conversation seems to be. And then uh, other ideas, you know, had little imagination, uh, a gorgeous selfishness, uh, tolerantly contemptuous liking for the sex. So uh, th that's, that's an odd phrase, right? We was talking about the, the opposite sex, a, a tolerantly contemptuous liking. So he, he likes women, but there's a, a, some sort of barrier there. All right, so a little drag and drop activity here. So uh, we're picking the most likely to contribute to Nick's appeal to women. So why does Nick appeal to women? He looks like a surgeon when he works. Looks like a surgeon when, he's, when he works, right? That's something that uh, would be an attraction. What else? Who's there? Who's that? driving he's a wizard at driving um yeah yep he's you know as it mentions behind the wheel right which goes along with his with his work and we got two more down here so what else will we put in there his behavior is selfish <laughs> yeah oddly enough right um and you know what they really mean by by selfish here is is sort of like his he's very self-interested right he's 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 very inside himself not necessarily that he's you know not a giving person but but this idea that he's you know sort of self-interested uh and maybe that makes him sort of mysterious and then finally what what would be the last one it makes no effort with women makes no effort with women <laughs> which <laughs> Drives drives some of us men crazy, you know. When 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 we we see why for some reason that works, um, yeah. So oddly enough, right? So we have he looks like a surgeon when he works. Uh, he's a wizard at driving. He has a sort of behavior is is selfish and he makes no effort with women. Uh, you know the other two. That's not going to you know that certainly doesn't necessarily interest women. He's got to pale complexion because he's in a garage all day or has a little imagination. So we'll submit that. Looks like a surgeon, wizard at driving, behavior selfish, makes no effort with women. All right. Oh, and now we're back to Edgar Allan Poe. So let's see, let's, let's switch it up a little bit. Um, Christiana, you want to read the first paragraph? We'll, we'll swap through here as we go. Uh, okay. Um, a visit from the police. As the bell sounded, 
they are. There came a, a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what I had, I now to fear. There, there entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity. Suavity as officers of the police. A shriek. Is it a shriek? Shriek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Um, suspicious, suspicious, is it suspicious, suspicious of, is it suspicious? Suspicious of foul, foul play had been aroused. Information had been logged at the police officers office and they the office and they the officers had been deputed 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 to, deputed to search the premises so uh you know this is this is coming you can kind of see what's happened right uh you know he's 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 done the deed he's 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 taken the life of the old man and um and the, the, the police have come around after hearing, you know, some, uh, you know, a shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night, suspicion of foul play had been aroused. So the police are, are, are sent out. Uh, perfect suavity, right? There's another one, uh, you kind of use context clues. Suavity, uh, you, you know, just think about suave. So they, they're, they're, they're cool. They're, you know, they, they are, you know, coming in with a sense of confidence, right they're they're chill you know um all right so uh grace could you take uh, paragraph two all right i smile for what i had i smile for what had i to fear i bid the i bid the gentleman welcome the shriek i said was my own in a dream the old man i mentioned was absent in the country I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. All right. Um, so now we're getting, um, you know, you know, he's, he's taken around the, the house. He's, he's, you know, with confidence, it's like, oh, you know, the old man's out in the country, you know, Come around, you know. You can see there's there's nothing amiss here. You know, well, there's there's all his belongings. Everything's in order, and and even putting him down in the room, uh, you know, place my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. So he's setting them in the room where he has buried the old man under them. That's how how confident he's feeling at the moment. Uh, but we'll see if that continues. Etta, you want to take paragraph three? Okay, the officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat in while I answered cheerily. They chatted of familiar things. But eerie long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached uh, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still, they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distant, more distinct. Distinct. It, conti it continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained deficientness until... De 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 definiteness? That, that's not a definite. very common word. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> definiteness yeah. 
until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. Yeah. So now he's starting to sweat it, right? Now it, it, it's it, it, he, he's feeling the guilt. He's worrying about it. It's, it, you know, it's, it's starting to sink in as he sits there. My head ached and fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted, uh, you know, but it continued and gained definiteness. So it's just, it's, it's becoming clear, you know, is, is, is basically what he's saying there. And I'll read that final uh, paragraph there. Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here is the beating of his hideous heart. So he's thinking that he's hearing the, the heart beating still of the old <laughs> right? So the telltale heart, that's the, that's the idea behind the telltale heart. The heart is telling on him. It's, it's, um, it's giving him up. So, yeah, so he, he's, he's finally lost it and he's basically, you know, turning himself in. So I was trying to, uh, uh, scare my wife with the villains and she didn't even look at me but i think it worked <laughs> guys um so uh number four if she's got earbuds in she, she can't hear me um so number four uh etta you want you want to read number four for us uh you said number four the um question yeah the narrator suggests that he felt no fear when the police officers arrived, which statement by the narrator implies that he felt more fear than he had claimed. Hello? Mm -hmm. You want to read the answers for us? Oh, wait. Things just jumped out. She had a phone call, maybe. All right. So the narrator suggests that he felt no fear when the police officer arrived. Uh, which statement by the narrator implies that he felt more fear than he claimed? A, the shriek I said was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. Uh, B, I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasure, secure and undisturbed. C, uh, in the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest for their fatigues. Uh, D, the officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. So what might make him seem a little less confident than um, what he's portraying there? Is there any mm -hmm. tip-offs? Anything? Is it... Is it D? It's D. Yeah, D is in D. the. Yeah. So it is kind of pointing to singularly at ease, right? It's that it's that word that's saying, you know, uh, you know, um, it, 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 the the, the definition is a little strange in this case, but it's it's it, it's it's showing that you know. For the moment, right? At at right now, he's 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 okay, but it's 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 tipping off that there might be problems as he goes. Uh, Tracy, you want to read number five for us? Yes. The police officers rest and chat off familiar things. What do these actions most? likely reveal about the police officers. A, they are unsuspecting. B, they are distrustful. C, they are apologetic. D, they are throat. Um, uh, A, they unsuspect. Yep. Hey, right. They're unsuspecting. They're they're very casual at this point, right? They're just talking among themselves. They they're they're relaxed. He's he's pulling it off. He's going to get away with it. Um, but uh, you know he he's going to give himself up. But yeah, a they're unsuspecting at this point. 
everything, nothing seems to miss. And uh, number six, Christiana, you want to read number six for us? Um, okay. On the basis of the details in paragraph three, which word best describe how the narrator feels as he sits with the of with the officers? A ill, B guilty, um, C confident, and um, D cheerful. Uh, is it A, A or B? Um, let's see, six B. B now he's starting B. to feel guilty as he sits with them. All right, yeah. So, uh, before you know, he was he was comfortable, but his he's the guilt starting to creep in, the innocence, you know, he, he, it, it's starting to work on him. So, as he sits with them, he's starting to feel guilty. Yeah, be guilty. Um, Grace, number seven. Okay. When the narrator hears the noise, the police officers sit and continue to chat. The police officers most likely a wonder about the narrator's headache. Be annoyed by the narrator's talkativeness. C, do not hear the noise that the narrator does. And D, are still trying to obtain evidence of foul play. Uh, is it C or D? Yeah, C is a cat, right? <laughs> yeah, so they're, you know, if they're still talking and he's starting to hear something, um, my ears ring all the time. Uh, so, you know, it, you can tell the difference if it's, if it's something in your head, particularly, you know, in this case, if the other people are not reacting to it, right? So if they're continuing on their... You know, if, you, if, this, if this was set in, uh, in you know, in a, in, in a scene, right? We, you, you may have seen some license in a movie or television where, you know, this person's kind of like getting anxious and sweating and 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 lose, getting ready to lose control, and maybe they're hearing, you know, like their heartbeat in their ear or they're hearing a ringing, and everybody else around them is just acting normal, right? They're laughing or they're just chatting amongst themselves, but this person's kind of getting real cagey. That's the idea here, right? That this is it's starting to eat at him while they're sitting there just talking amongst themselves. All right, so eight, um, Etta, back to you. You want to take eight for us? Okay. It says the narrator is motivated to confess most likely because he believes that a, house is alive, B, officers are criminals, C, officers are tricking him, or D, old man's heart is beating, and it's D. Yeah, <laughs> A is D. All right, and let's see. Okay, Sister Carrie, so we have one final, our final bit of text, I think. I don't wanna get ahead of myself. Yeah, so the last text of the year. <laughs> guys so um tracy would you like to read paragraph one yes sister carrie lived for chicago when yeah. Carolyn meeper brought the the afternoon train for chicago uh, her total outfit consisted of a small trunk a cheap imitation alligator skin shell a small lunch in a paper puck and a yellow leather snap purse containing her ticket, a scrap of paper with her sister's address and four dollars in money. It was in August 1889, she was 18 and full of the illusion of ignorance and good. Whatever touch up reject at parting characteristics her thoughts, it was certainly not for advantage. Now being given up a gush of tears 
at her mother's farewell kiss. A touch in her throat when the cars collect by the, the flour mill where her father worked a pathetic try as the fam familiar green environment of the, of the village bus and the turret which bowed her so life lightly to the hood and harm were in irretrievably broken. Okay. And Christiana, you want to do the next paragraph? Oh, okay. <laughs> paragraph two. To be sure, there was always the next station where one might descend and return. There was a great. <laughs> There was the great city bound more closely by this very trace, which came up daily. Columbia City was not so far away. Even once she was in Chicago, she gazed, gazed at the green land landscape. Now passing in Swift. Please, that word is it? Swift. Okay, Swift. Review. Swift review. Until her Swift, Swift thought replaced its impressions, impression with vague, is it vague, 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 gorgeous. Congestion, congestions of what Chicago might be. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Vague conjectures is like, you know, when you when you using conjecture, you're you're basically making assumptions. So vague assumptions of what Chicago might be. It's another way to put it there. Uh, Grace, last paragraph. Okay. Kalonai or sister Carrie as she had been half affectionately termed by the family, was possessed of a mind rudimentary in its power of observation and analysis. Self-interest with her was high, but not strong. It was nevertheless her guiding characteristics, warm with her fancies of youth, pretty with the insipid prettiness of the formative period, possessed of a figure promising eventual shapelessness and an eye allied with certain native intelligence she was. Two generations removed from the immigrant. Books were beyond her interest. In the initiative graces. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Intuitive, yeah. Oh, okay. In the intuitive graces, she was so crude. She could scarcely toss her head gracefully. Her hands were almost ineffectual, and yet she was interested in her charms, quick to understand the keener pleasures of life, ambitious to gain in material things. A half-equipped little knight she was, venturing to reconnoitre a mysterious city and dreaming wild dreams from Sister Kerry by Theodore Dresser in 1900. Right. Yeah, and reconnoiter, yeah, that, that's the act of performing reconnaissance, right? Recon, might you know, hear that a lot of in war movies and stuff. So out there investigating the city. Um, go ahead and read uh, number nine for us while you're at it. Okay. The details in the first sentence of paragraph one revealed that Caroline may but mostly like A, travels extensively, B, has important connections, C, come, comes from a poor family, and D, visit her sister often. Is it C? Uh, D, D, visits her sister often. Yeah. D as in dog. All right. 
And Etta, would you like to read number 11? Uh, hold on, you said number 11. I'm sorry, no, wait, 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 I'm off one. Am I get a 10? Number, number nine, yeah, number nine was C, I'm sorry. I was, I was, I was, <laughs> I was off my, my game there. Nine is C. Okay, so you're right. Yeah, it comes from a poor family. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, and yeah, we know that like, you know, the imitation alligator, you know, stuff and, and all that. So sorry about that. 10, Etta. <laughs> okay, Carrie has mixed emotion as she leaves Columbia City. Which statement best describes her feelings? A, she loves the land, but recognizes the need to earn a living elsewhere. She believes she is too sophisticated for small town life and is happy to leave. C, she is devoted to her parents, but welcomes Chicago's educational opportunities. Or D, she is somewhat sad to leave, but curious about leave, living in a big city. Is it D? Yeah, D, right? She's curious about living there. Yeah, kind of, okay, you know, so half a quick little night she was venturing to reconnoiter the mysterious city and dreaming wild dreams. Alludes to that. All right, and 11, uh, Tracy, would you like to take number 11 for us? On my 12 fold, I should have um, 227. If you're there. I don't know if you're there or if you're muted or unavailable. So yeah. uh, I'll go ahead and read number 11 for us. So which word best characterizes Carrie? Is she A, discourteous, B, uh, unformed, C, talented, D, charming? Is it D? Yeah, D, she's charming. Yep. Okay. And then 11, oh, I'm sorry, that was 11. Wait a minute. I'm, ooh, boy, I'm, I don't know what's wrong with me. It's unformed. B is unformed. Or, it's been a long week, I guess. 11 is B as a boy unformed. I don't know why I'm getting off here. I'm, I, maybe I'm trying to rush through because I know we're at the end. She's she's not polished, right? Unformed is sort of not polished. Uh, comes from a poor family. Okay, so, so that's the idea there. B. Be B. Number okay, number 12. Um, so uh, number 12, the narrator describes Carrie as a half-equipped little knight venturing to reconnoiter the mysterious city to show that Carrie is um, A, a small but heroic crusader about to embark on an important adventure, B, unskilled, uneducated, and foolish about the work she chooses to do, C, ambitious but poorly prepared to face the challenges of city life, D, an accomplished woman who despite humble beginnings will succeed in her ventures. D? C. Yeah, C is in cat. Yeah, ambitious, yeah. right? She's yeah. interested, uh, but not prepared, right? That that idea, a half-equipped little knight she was. So that's indicating that she's, you know, anxious and wants to be involved, but maybe not prepared. C is in cat. I'm going to go ahead and read the last one too. Uh, so 13, on the basis of the details in paragraph three, Carrie probably will A, feel overwhelmed by Chicago and return home. Yeah, B, start a successful business with her sister. C, become deeply committed to a worthy cause. Or D, learn social graces and use them to her advantage. Good D. D, right? We see her as somebody that's going to be adaptable. You know, if mm -hmm. nothing else, she is adaptable. So yeah, D is a dog. So um, in, in, in my... Uh, Kind of messing up the numbers there. Does anybody need or missing anything? Answer. Yes, I miss a number 10. 10 was D as in dog. Anything else missing for anybody? Okay, so I'll take that as a no. Any questions about uh, stuff from social studies 